Okay. Yeah, can you hear it? Test, one, two, three, one, two, three. Go ahead and tell us your name and spell it. Yeah, Doug Irwin, D-O-U-G-E-R-W-I-N. Yeah, the culture is the hardest to work on and the most important, or one of the most important things. Yeah. So, you know, from day one, we started doing that cultural work. The challenge with that is it's hard to show, it's hard to put metrics around it, but it's super important. You know, when we first started doing this work, you know, you had a couple of predominant cultural narratives. It's like, you know, we're gaming town. It's like, oh, I'm going to keep my car cards close to my chest. Yeah. Or a mining one. Like, we're hanging out at the bar, but you come on my land, I'm going to shoot you. Mm -hmm. Those are not good cultural experiences for entrepreneurship. Right. Right. So we worked very hard to set up a collaborative um, culture that people try hard, fail together. We did fail cons. We did all these things to help work on the culture. Yeah. So that would be the one thing I would say is really keep an eye on the culture, knowing that it's challenging, it's the hardest work, and it's the least definable, and so that can sometimes make it challenging to fun. Hey, look where we are. Welcome to Reno. It's cold out. Grace is cold. We believe that anyone, anywhere, can make startups. After spending more than a decade building our own company, we've learned a ton. We've mentored founders and built startup communities. We've helped craft government policies, and we've also invested in businesses, some that succeeded and some that didn't. We've helped thousands of startup founders, funders, and facilitators. We're inspired by their dreams and determination. Our goal is to travel across America and meet as many as we can, to tell their story and share their lessons. We're on a mission to help you succeed, to show you that you aren't crazy, you aren't alone, you really can do this. We're here to make startups together. Well, are we recording? Yeah, we are recording. Officials? We're officially oh, recording right now, so we just sort of ease into it. Um, how long have you been? In the ecosystem. I've been doing ecosystem work for almost 12 years now. So I started at EDON in 2013, um, kind of in official capacity, and created uh, the program that we have now at EDON. There wasn't a program for entrepreneurship before that. I did a little bit of that kind of work freelance, sort of, um, I guess, inside of an entrepreneurs organization. I really got the bug when I, you know, after being an EO for many, many years, and just yeah. seeing the impact it had on myself and my you know, my business and wanted to really bring that out to the community. So what is it that you think really pulls you into doing this work? Thanks. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit of yeah, we need the essentials. essentials. And it's decaf, so it doesn't really count. It's just more for flavor. <laughs> so what pulls me into this work? Yeah. I, I think being an entrepreneur, you know, I, I was an entrepreneur for many, many years. I had five different companies. You know, I've been through all of the, well, not all, but a lot of the challenges of being an entrepreneur, you know, raising capital, laying people off, growing, doing all of those things. And so you know, the opportunity to kind of be on the other side and help people pursue their entrepreneurial dream really resonates with me. Uh, you know, one of the things I didn't realize in being an entrepreneur that one of the things that really resonates with me, one of my core values is being of service. Yeah. And so I, you know, through this work, I get a chance to be of service and then see the impact play out on a community scale, not okay. just in the company. Okay. What's the, uh, what is the entrepreneurial ecosystem in, in Reno? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's small but mighty, I would say, you know, kind of like biggest little city. I mean, we have um, a really well-connected ecosystem. People work very collaboratively. We worked really hard over the past 11 years to build a set of core values based largely on uh, the book, The Rainforest. You know, I got a chance to work with Victor mm -hmm. early on, like when he was at T2 Venture Partners. Yeah. And we adapted the rules of the rainforest as sort of our uh, core values. And so you know, one of that, we've done a lot of work to, to, to build and, I guess, enforce those. 
kind of modeled a little bit by Burning Man. You know, okay. you know we, Burning Man's in our backyard, and yeah. it's a really interesting cultural experiment. And you know, there are ten principles and our core values. It's just how do you like bring those alive? Okay. So anyway, long way of saying that um, our ecosystem is well connected. It's still, you know, gaining sophistication. I, I was really surprised at how long it actually takes. We've been doing this for a long time. Right. Right. Um, but where we started to where we are today, it's dramatic yeah. change. Okay. But we still have a long way to go. We're probably I don't know thirty to fifty percent of the way there. Okay. Or okay. maybe there's never a there there. But. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Tell us what what you think the outsider's perception is of Reno versus the insider's perception. Yeah, I, I think the perception of Reno has gotten better over the years, but it started so low. You know, even the Muppets made fun of us. I mean, they, you know, like, so, and we're always compared to like a second rate Vegas or something. So people that haven't experienced Reno in a long time, really their only experience of it is either through you know, 911, some other things, or okay. some experience from the past. Okay. What they don't see is this, you know, this really well-connected, beautiful community that's very much about business and okay. less about gaming. You know, gaming is a, such a small percentage of our economy relative to our neighbors in the South. We've had a radical transformation over the past 10 years. Tesla being, you know, the biggest... Um, company, you know, that's of, of note, but okay. there's been hundreds of other manufacturers and technology companies that have come in and really remade our economy here. Okay. So it's just a great place to, to live. It's a great place to work and it's a great place to raise a family. And, you know, I think if you like the outdoors and you like all those things, this is, it couldn't be in a better place. Yeah. You know, the, we're still a small community. And so, you know, access to talent, access to capital, all those things are a little bit more challenging than they are in a bigger economy or a bigger city, but we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you want to take turns? Well, yeah, you go. Ahead okay. So, knowing that you've been doing this for 11 or 12 years, uh -huh. we've actually been doing that about the same time. It was something about yeah. 2012 yep. sort of like <laughs> launched us. Startup America partnership, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm curious, you know, we know the peaks and valleys of what it is to do an ecosystem. And I wondered if you could share with us maybe some of the, the things that didn't quite work out or some things you've experimented with yeah, yeah. that you could tell future ESOs, you know, don't do it this way or maybe do it this way. Yeah. You could share something, maybe a story or two. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've tried pretty much all things. I mean, not all of them, but um, the way I look at it is we're just always run, running a constant or we're constantly running experiments. Okay. You know, so we were like the sixth city to bring in one million cups. Um, that works great for like eight years. Yeah. And then it sort of fizzled out. Yeah. And so we had to readapt it. So, you know, would I say don't get not, not one million cups? No, I wouldn't say that. I think that for me, it's just a really a matter of constantly experimenting and reiterating. Um, we, in our role, and I think that's the thing that's interesting for us as an economic development agency, what is our highest, best good? And so I'm constantly thinking about how our role evolves. So in the early days, I ran Startup Weekends. We built a mentor program. We did all these things where we were more in the work. Yeah. As more entrepreneurial support organizations have come on board, our role has shifted. Okay. And we've kind of shifted up to more of a 50,000 foot view and working on things like policy, trying to bring in grants to, to create funds, those types of things. But that, you know, that it's met with some, you know, there's there's challenges there. Like if you control the work, you have, sometimes you have a little bit more control over how things happen. Yeah. And if you're more of a catalyst, you have to leave it to, uh, leave it to chance more. <laughs> yeah. I'm really curious just to deep dive a little bit. Like, can you describe the transition from being more on the, like, in the weeds, grassroots to getting to the 50,000 foot level and how did you make that change. Yeah, I think that uh, the way I look at that is sort of capacity building. Okay. Um, you know, I took what R Brad Feld to heart in um, startup communities. You know, we're really want entrepreneurs to lead. So what we started to see is that even with One Million Cups, like we brought it in, we funded it for a long time, but then there was a group of people that said, we really want to own this. So we learned how to transition those things. And so what we, our role became more of a catalyst. So we would kind of look at the ecosystem and be like, okay, there's a gap in seed funding. Yeah. I could either create a seed fund myself, or I could go get a grant, create a seed fund, and find a GP to run it. And so that model tends to work better for us, which is like identify the gap, figure out how to close the gap, but then ultimately 
don't run it long term. Because mm -hmm. what I found is then we kind of get pigeonholed or we become competitive with other people in the ecosystem. Yes. Now, I'm not sure that's universally true, but um, that's been our approach to be more of a catalyst than an operator. Um, like we, we ran the first uh, Reno Startup <laughs> Week this last year. Okay. Huge success for us, especially for a first year event. You know, thousands of thousand individual participants, like 500 people signed up, 55 events throughout a week. Yeah. Um, and we did the heavy lifting, but it really was, from the financial standpoint, but it really was a community event by the community for the community. Mm -hmm. So I prefer that model than me owning and operating a particular program. Right. Now that may evolve, you know, um, as we look at things like revolving loan funds and other things like that, potentially real estate, but other things that could change. But yeah. at this point, given the structure of our organization, our funding, being a catalyst seemed to be a better model. And what that's allowed is the rise of some other ESO groups like Startup Nevada, um, the Small Business Development Center's taken on a big role, the University's Innovation Center. So we provide kind of a convening um, function too. So we bring all those people together, yeah. help drive strategy, and then help fill the gaps rather than just operating, say, an accelerator. Yeah. We brought in a generator to run an accelerator okay. instead of us trying to build one. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. It sounds like that's how you really mitigate against the competitive forces becoming too strong within the community. I mean, we try, right? I mean, yeah. you know, it's, I think when my experience, and this is one of the challenges, like in the beginning, when everybody's getting going, there's lots of goodwill. And then when there's a grant and it's kind of winners and losers, it gets a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, I think that this is where my, my primary core value is entrepreneur first. And this is, I preach this all the time, which is like, as long as we're doing the right thing for the entrepreneur, then we won't be misaligned. It gets a little tricky when you have two seed funds yeah. competing. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they're not, I mean, they are in it for themselves, but they're ultimately in it for the entrepreneur. And so we kind of provide that mitigating factor. Like this is really what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, not to say there aren't challenges in that regard. People want to, you know, be in deals and things like that. But, do you have, um, do you have any particular success story or founder that you can sort of say like, like because of the work that you've done it allowed them to scale or ipo or yeah bring yeah. them or just even jobs yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah totally i mean you know we're i think we're all looking for that mythical like that unicorn that goes public and kicks the flywheel off and we've got one of those incubating but okay um you know up to this point most of the wins have been We've had a couple of wins where people have sold their company. Okay. It came through our mentor program. American Duchess is a really great example. Uh, she did period-specific shoes, built that company, went through our mentor program. And I ran into her the other day at our generator. She's like, I'm retired now. Wow. So she sold her company. You have to that. turn her into an investor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Trainer Road is another really good, awesome operating company. Um, met him early on. He's okay. you know, got a very successful company now, joined EO, does a lot of give back for us. So there's a. Uh, so you can take a little bit of credit for thinking, had you not been here, maybe they weren't as successful because you either made introductions or yeah. helped them with seed funding or access to capital. Absolutely, okay. I definitely feel. Okay. I feel. Yeah, we have. You know, I think we're always our own worst critics, and so I keep wanting to have that like unicorn. I was just on the phone with some folks from Utah, and they were showing how their ecosystem was built, and it it helps when you have two unicorns that IPO. In the early days, <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. those, you know, those, those are the seeds that were planted. Yeah. And yeah. you know, like everybody's ecosystem is different, right? You yeah. got to play the, you have to play the game that, or the, with the cards that you're dealt, like yeah. the hand you're dealt. And you know, us being really close to Silicon Valley, I think is can be both a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. And if you think about where when we started in 2012, it was sort of a curse. Anybody that got any size or had any potential got sucked into the black hole of the valley because yeah. back then. They wouldn't invest in you if you didn't come there. So all of our talent went west. Mm -hmm. Now it's a little bit different, right? A lot of companies are coming out of California. The cost structure is different. So being close is more of a benefit now. But you know, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of raw materials to mm -hmm. work with. Like mm -hmm. the founder quality, all of those things in the early days was pretty tough. Yeah. So we've had to import talent, work on programs to bring people up. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it, but you know, overall I feel like the, the net effect of our work is, yeah, we've had a huge impact on the community. Mm -hmm. If you look at just, this is, you know, there are many metrics, but just a simple one. When we started working, I think there was maybe 20 to $30 million in venture invested in the community. Um, last year, or this, yeah, I guess 2023, 
which was a horrible year for venture, we still hit 1.1 billion. Wow. And a couple years ago, you know, we hit a peak of 1.6 billion. Okay. Now there's, you know, again, one company skews a lot of that, but yeah. even taking that out, you're still at like six, seven hundred million dollars in venture money. Again, yeah. it's it's only one measure, but I think that that's a that's monster a good impact. I'm, I'm really curious because there's such a wide gamut across the country, right? And you talk about Silicon Valley, like in Augusta, we talk about Atlanta and, and so forth, but. Um, Knowing you were at 20 million, now you're at over a billion in venture capital. What do you tell to the communities that haven't even gotten to 20 million yet? It takes a long time. <laughs> Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. You know, it, it doesn't, you know, our first One Million Cups had like five people at it, mm -hmm. and then it grew to 100 people. You know, I think that if you just What's that old adage like you overestimate what you can do in a year and you underestimate what you can do in 10? Mm. And so to me, that's kind yeah. of as long as you have the North Star and you keep moving, you know, the ball yeah. every day, yeah. eventually you'll get to something that looks like that. And it may not be that may not be the right figure. Right. I think we, there's always a debate here. Or, you know, we, t we call ourselves a tech hub as a, you know, a marketing thing, which I think is there's truth to that. But if you look at our base and our workforce, it's mm -hmm. more of an industrial base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have to be a little, we have to be honest about what we can be. I think the long-term vision is that we will continue to be a tech hub, but it's going to require years of upcycling talent and going right. through the transition. Right. Right. So if you were to not underestimate 10 years from now and try to be, you know, where, where do you where do you really think that this community can be with ten more years? Yeah, um, I think we're sitting on one of the most unique opportunities that I've ever seen in the community. Honestly, um, the where I think we're in a unique position to be world class or definitely national best in class in EV battery production and EV materials. Okay. We have a unique environment where we have large deposits of lithium. We have um, you know four of the major ten recyclers. Okay. We have a whole community committed to our community. That's okay. It's okay. We'll edit all that out. We'll edit those guys out. We'll see how good our sound editing is. <laughs> so if you were to... Um... So we, we, and like we just got a tech hub designation yeah. for lithium. Yeah. Yeah. If, we get the, if we get the funding for it, it's going to... You know, that'll pass. Even if we don't get the funding for it, I think the, the ship is already sailing on that. Okay. Um, you know, you look at the investments that Tesla's made, the spin out of Redwood, all the Israeli companies, like we have the potential to be world class in something. Okay. Which was always a challenge, right? You're an emerging ecosystem. You're like, what am I what are we gonna be known for? You know, hey, one fintech company, you're like, oh, we're gonna be a fintech hub. Right. So everybody this, everyone everyone wants to know your vertical, right? Yeah, totally. Oh, we have the blockchains. Oh, we're gonna be blockchain. I'm like, no, we're not gonna be blockchain. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So this is something Northern Nevada can really like own because we have the resources, the capability, all of those things. Well, just like Vegas. I mean, it's hard to displace Vegas as the hospitality capital of the world. Like, that's probably not going to change. Yeah, yeah. But no, I'm there, guessing 12 years ago, everybody thought you were going to be like a gaming and hospitality tech company. Yeah, and but I think it was lost. We didn't know what we were going to be. Like, to this day, still some of the gaming folks, which still have a lot of power in our community, Yeah. Um, you know, we're... We're reminiscing about the power of the bowlers. Like the bowlers are not going to save us. Right? The, the, bowl, the bowlers. The bowlers. Like we have a bowling stadium. Oh, okay. And that was like a big moneymaker for the town. So yeah. you have, you know, the traditional power structure. We have a changing that, of the guard. Exactly. And I think a lot of communities that went through either recessions or mm -hmm. flight of talent are, are reimagining themselves. Absolutely. And it sounds like you have not only you, but you have your ecosystem already here. I mean, we can tell just walking through your downtown and seeing, you know, what, what you have here as a community. And so, like, my question to you is, you know, if you were to describe, if you were trying to attract a founder and entrepreneur to come to Reno, what would be, like, three to five words that you would use to describe, like, why your city would be that place? Yeah. Um, I think it's a good question. I would say, you know, we're well connected. It's okay. a great place to live. Okay. Number one, like you can live and build your company. Like you don't have to make the trade-offs. I guess that would that would be one of the that probably that would be one thing I would say. It's like you don't have to make the same trade-offs you would in other places for for life and company. Okay. Um, you know, we're close enough to major markets to 
access to your customers, but you can, you can still build a strong company with good talent and access all the things you need and live well here. Okay. I don't know. That's, that's off that's the top. I should probably have that one canned, but that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> well, what, it, what do you say is the best thing about being a founder in Reno and what is the worst thing about being a founder in Reno? I think the best thing is everybody's got your back. Like this is a barn raising community and everybody rolls up their sleeves and wants to help you be successful. I think the hardest thing about being here is it's still not as sophisticated as some of the other markets. So, you know, um, access to capital can be challenging. Access to, you know, battle hardened teams can be a little bit challenging. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, those are, it, it, but if you can solve for those two, so the companies that are very successful here have brought capital in from outside yeah. and maybe have our core, like their dev team is battle hardened and in the Bay Area or some other market, but then they can build their the rest of their team here. Figure is a good example, Mike Cagney's company. Okay. You know, their dev team is in the Bay Area, pretty big presence there, and then their largest second spot is here, and they have all of their customer success, they have blockchain things going on here. So those types of companies where you can really take advantage of our strengths and mitigate some of the weaknesses, those really work well. Um, that's improving though. I mean, we've got, you know, what I, the great thing about, there is such a great thing about COVID, but one of the things that we benefited from, from COVID. It's always a hard thing to say. Yeah. It's a bittersweet. Yes is all of the flight, people just decided because of remote work, like, hey, I can choose to live wherever. Yeah. And so the you've got this major influx of talent. I mean, the head of Silicon Valley Bank Capital mm -hmm. is here. Yeah. And, you know, people like that just didn't exist in Reno. And we have, you know, former successful founders at Y Combinator. So we have these really amazing people that um, are still plugged into their communities yeah. there, but then are able to bring some of that wisdom and that connectivity here. How well do they integrate with this community or the, are they starting to like radically change what people think about? Yeah, I think that it's, it's that's slow. I mean, we make, we have a concerted effort. I call it kind of community integration. Okay. Any person like that we find, we run, bring to our founder dinners, we invite them to all these things. We try and bring them into the fold and make sure that they feel part of the community. I mean, the biggest concern you have is someone like that comes here and goes to like an event and it's like, these are not my people, and then they check out. Right. So I try and get in front of those and then try and curate experiences as best we can for, for that. Um, Any just tips so, on how to do that? Because I think that has become a common experience post-COVID for a lot of communities. Yeah. I, I really like this idea. We do a founder dinner series. Okay. And the, the formula, I told it from a guy in the Bay Area. Um, basically, you, you know, it's... Invite only, you find founders of, you know, that are, uh, they have pureness, kind of like an EO. And that pureness can be a broad category, but okay. um, you want basically people to look around and be like, yeah, these are all people that are kind of like, that, you know, have the same same success or trying to look at the same things, like the same stage of, of capital, what have you. Okay. Um, and then we open up someone's private home, we bring in a chef, we get it sponsored by a law firm, and we just have like a really nice, intimate social gathering. We kind of mix it up and make it interesting. Okay. And so that's just a really good way. And then we bring in, you know, we bring in some founders from the accelerators and things like that. So it does, it's, it's not like, I don't, it's not exclusionary, but you want it to be, you know, peer driven. Yeah. One of the things we learned at the, we had the MIT mentorship program here. One of the things we learned from that is, um, you know, the mentors are your limited quantity. Like okay. you're always going to have entrepreneurs, right? right? And right. you know, no, no, no value judgment there. But like, you got to keep the mentor pool intact. And so, who you invite to the mentor pool is really important because if all of a sudden, you know, that that kind of gets down to the where people are like, mm, this doesn't really feel like my group, okay. and you lose that talent. So I kind of taking that same thing. It takes some nuance because you want to make sure you're not right. biased and leaving people out that should that should be there. But you're right. kind of building right. that that pureness around a founder or investor. So whenever the new investors come to town, bringing them together. Yeah. So we host a couple of those types of more intimate gatherings to help. So are your investor dinners different than your founder dinners? Yeah. You don't intermingle and them? We do intermingle them oh, once do. a year. Okay. Yeah. So we tend to have, we have, we'll do a founder dinner, we'll do an investor dinner, and then well, we do a couple of those and then we'll bring them together as yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's the kind of size for those dinners? 30 would be the maximum. That's a lot, actually. Yeah. 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 Okay. So okay. 15 to, 15 to 30. I yeah. Mean, so we experiment with that and, you know, we just yeah. kind of play and see what, what 
it works. But I think that's a, what I've found about that is that's, especially for new people, that's a really good way to get new people integrated. Yeah. Because they show up and they're like, oh, you have a Series A company. Oh, I sold my company here. Oh, I'm an investor here. Like that helps and they can build their own network yeah. versus just coming to like a pitch contest, which might be, you know, yeah. maybe hit or miss depending on the yeah. thing. Right, right. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're asking, so we have, you know, a series of 10 questions or so. Um, the other, and, and uh, we're trying to be consistent in asking people the same questions. Yep. So Veronica, kind of move it all together. Hi. No, it's okay. Hi, hi, hi. hi. We're, gonna, we're doing an interview here, but we'll hi. grab a chair and we'll. Hi, I'm sorry, guys. Are you sure? I can wait until you're done. Get a coffee or something. We'll... Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, what would you do if you uh, had access to a million dollars, a million more dollars? We're gonna each. We're gonna ask each ESO the same question. Yeah. And just kind of see how we can sort of blend it all together. I mean, right now. I would use that to seed a couple of different seed funds. Okay. Like okay. I, there, we've got a couple. Of, we our both of our seed funds are sort of stuck at mm -hmm. the moment. Like one is finished its first fund and it's trying to get the second fund, and the other one's sort of raising capital. And like I think even a million dollars would break break that free. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's the most strategic thing I could think of, but that's the thing that in the moment right now it would it would unlock that because that's a capacity that we had that we're right now we don't have um, and are there particular verticals within those seed funds are you looking for is it industry or demographics or I think that the I mean we have a good LP base for this one fund and I think just having a broad-based fund okay we have accelerators that are going into these verticals so I feel I feel good about that um, right now there definitely is a capital issue okay um, which again is not usually always the biggest issue. But um, the, my second one would probably be I would really go explore a, a uh, venture studio. Okay. We, that's one thing we have never tried. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm not, you know, I have to really dig into that. Yeah. And that one seems like a harder one for us to catalyze. Yeah. Than one we might have to operate. Um, so do you have any questions for us? What are you guys doing on this trip? <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I'll, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll share a part yeah. really quick because yeah. it, it also is kind of really the main question that I want to get to you, which is, I think that in doing this work for the last decade, you know, we've had like a couple of really key insights that have allowed us to grow and yeah. a huge piece of what we do now is we talk about this finance industry credentialing and workforce and we built our own like AI software tools that automate all the record tracking and all of that within it but it's like like that's our insight our contribution to the field and you know now that you're let's just say battle hardened from years of doing this what is what is like the key insight that you would share with the community of ecosystem builders around the country mm -hmm. well <laughs> I mean, I, I think that for me, the thing would be getting your value alignment set up correctly from the very beginning. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm you know, maybe this is just me, but I'm a very value-centered person. So, like, my core values for our team are entrepreneur first, raise the bar, be of service, you know, stewards of culture, and make an impact. A little redundant. But I use the core values as the filter criteria for all decision making hiring whatever and so to me that has always been my guiding north star so like foundationally whenever i come back to the work i always think about that like does this do the right thing for entrepreneurs you know does this really make an impact in the community are we being of service and how does this fit into the culture so to me i don't know how i would make decisions or do that without getting that foundationally set up for yeah. so to me i'm a big fan of like getting those core values in order and okay. figuring it out um the other thing that and again, maybe this is just a function of working with Victor for so many years. Working on the culture. Mm. You know, the culture is the hardest to work on and the most important, or one of the most important things. Yeah. So, you know, from day one, we started doing that cultural work. The challenge with that is it's hard to show, it's hard to put metrics around it, but it's super important. You know, when we first started doing this work, you know, you had a couple of, 
predominant cultural narratives. It's like, you know, we're gaming town. It's like, oh, I'm going to keep my car, cards close to my chest. Yeah. Or a mining one. Like, we're hanging out at the bar, but you come on my land, I'm going to shoot you. Mm-hmm. Those are not good cultural experiences for entrepreneurship. Right. Right. So we worked very hard to set up a collaborative um, cu- culture that people try hard, fail together. We did fail cons. We did all these things to help work on the culture. Yeah. So that would be the one thing I would say is really keep an eye on the culture. Knowing that it's challenging, it's the hardest work, and it's the least definable, and so that can sometimes make it challenging to fund. Yeah. I think it's hard because, I mean, I know in our experience, like, if you're applying for grants or getting funding, sponsors, like, culture is not the thing that they talk about wanting to fund. Correct. Right? They want, like, how many jobs are you going to create, you know, that sort of thing. And so I would imagine that, that for you to have, A, been here for so long and kind of almost, like, stuck it out, yeah. like, that's... You know, that's part of your success, right? Yeah. Um, I think the fact, it sounds to me like you're not going anywhere either. So you're going to continue to sort of, like, there's no goal. Like, this is this is the journey. Yeah, this yeah. is your process, right? Yeah. And yeah. so you're just kind of enveloping more people. Like, you're widening the pie, yeah. so to speak, as opposed to, like, okay, this is my pie. Correct. So, in fact, one of the reasons why we went to SCN, yeah. um, I did get a grant to basically um, run Startup Week, but the other thing was to build, help build out the next generation of uh, ecosystem builders. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be 50 this year. Yeah. I'm going to keep doing this work because I love it, but how do we bring up the next generation? Yeah. So, we brought a whole group of people to, um, to SCN for this reason. I want them to get steeped in the culture of ecosystem building so that that work continues and grows. Yeah. This is why we, you know, focus on policy now. We got the Right to Start Act passed. Um, the created Office of Entrepreneurship. Those types of things will have lasting impact. Um, Was there an entrepreneur ecosystem before you showed up? I mean, definitely. There was there was some things that happened before. Um, okay. There was a, there was a venture fund long, long ago, Nevada Ventures, and they had some success, kind of in the early dot com. Uh, uh, there's still an artifact, a group called NCET, the Nevada Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. Okay. Um, they do, you know, they, they still exist. They do some awards. We do some stuff with them. So that, but it was, you know, it was definitely ecosystem, not even 1.0. I don't even know that they actually knew it. Yeah. Because we yeah. didn't even know we were calling ecosystem Right, building. right, right. So. I mean, that's part of the conversation now with ecosystem builders. Is it wasn't like, until Victor's book. Right? Yeah. Is there, is there, a, new, is there, there a new de- definition for what we're doing? Yeah. Some yeah. people have been like, they've been doing it for decades. And, yeah, you know. it was. Great. I mean, that's the great thing too is just finding other people that are like these are our people, and yeah, yeah. You know, we know that this is what we're. Oh, this is what we call ourselves now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the thing that you did really well, which I think every community should try to do, is um, you identified very clearly what were the endemic cultural barriers to creating, you know, sharing and trust and collaboration between people because I think every community has something that's there but I think a lot of times we're all just butting our head up against the wall and trying to figure out what it is yeah but, like those are like really clear fundamental examples to this this culture of this community that's been around for you know yeah. years right and I, we, fortunately the recession made it easier because it was bad here I mean it was 14 and a half percent unemployment mm-hmm. people are like you want to try something? Go ahead, man. We don't, you know, whatever. I mean, we got a, uh, we know, seed, an accelerator fund out of the city in the first couple of years we were here. They gave us half a million dollars to go, like, make investments in companies because wow. they were, they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. And yeah. so we, you know, like, it's been now that there's more success and progress, it's a little bit harder. I think, you know, whatever, a, a crisis is a horrible thing to waste. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. But um, I, I do think that we, I mean, we spent a lot of time, I don't have my startup deck with us, but you know, we would have collaboration coins where we would give people a coin. It could, it was, we worked out a bunch of deals with coffee and food places that it would be good for a free cup of coffee or free beer, but you had to take an entrepreneur out to get it. So the way that we would enforce the cultural, enforce, we would encourage the culture was through these little interactions. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and this is, we learned a lot of this at Burning Man. They have the rules, like don't, you know, leave no trace. Yeah. But the way that's reinforced is when you see people picking up the smallest little thing here and there, everybody else is like, oh, okay. So creating role models and creating ways for people to interact. So like like being the change you want to be. Yeah. And sort of how do you create that? Yeah. Small steps. But but again, we were in a container where I think everything was open and now it's 
Plus, I think our culture is a bit of a barn raising community anyway. We're pretty, we're pretty. I mean, you're attracting those kinds of people, and if they're not interested in that, you're just kind of like, it's yeah, okay. Yeah. Keep moving yeah. on. Yeah. So just previewing, you, you've lined up some other conversations for us. Yeah. Uh, what are you hoping that we will learn about Reno today? Um, well, I hope you get a chance to see it through my eyes. Okay. You know what I what I see. I mean, I always appreciate people looking at it from an outside perspective and saying, "Hey, have you considered this?" You know, one of the challenges of being doing this for so long is you you know it's hard to be, have beginner mind over and over again. So I always yeah. appreciate outside perspectives, looking at what we have, what where you can see opportunities where other people have. So I'd love for you to you know to walk away and be like, "Wow, they're really doing these things, and this is great." And then you know what? Have they considered X, Y, Z? That could be yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Um, most of our good ideas have been borrowed or. Oh, adapted. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, you can quote stuff from so totally. many communities and say, like, it wasn't my, you know, you don't take credit for it because you're like, yeah. and that's why, you know, a lot of our, like, when we started our interview with you, that's what I wanted to know about, like, what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. So we see the cadence of, you know, hackathons and makerspaces yeah. and one million cups, like, oh, yeah. all of the things that sort of weave themselves in and out of place. Because yeah. honestly, Maker Fair kind of you, came and went. You have a lot in common. Yeah. with a lot of the other communities. And that's sort of, again, why we're doing this road shows, because we're trying to see, like, okay, what's the consistency yeah. that actually does work in these communities? And then how can we learn from those that didn't? And maybe it is that you have to try something yeah. because you, because not all communities might be bar yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, I mean, maybe it's just the entrepreneur in me. I'm constantly paranoid about being co-opted. or so, so I'm constantly thinking about, like, what is our highest, best good? Yeah. yeah. And so... You know, and I don't have any problem having sacred cow barbecue. It's like one million cups like came to the end and was like, oh my God, we got to save it. I'm like, maybe we don't need to save it. Yeah. yeah. Like maybe it needs, it's run its course. I mean, nine years is amazing. And so what? when one million cups went away, we launched Elevate and launched Reno mm -hmm. and changed the format, mixed it up. Yeah. And I think that's pre-COVID, people would happily go to coffee on a Monday morning at nine o'clock. Post COVID, you're like, mm, zoom in. So like, yeah, you have to yeah, be constantly yeah. adapting, and I didn't, I didn't look at that as a failure at all. We like, it's a season. Yeah, we I like. Think about, I think about it like a season. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had a wake for one man cups yeah. and moved on. And so, to me, but that takes a lot of like, you have to be really comfortable with the fact that you know, like, things are going to come and things are going to go. Like, it's not. Yeah. yeah, you have to be able to really be able to shift to the needs, mm -hmm. um, and then bring people around you that can help. Because again, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm almost 50 now. I'm not thinking. We're the elders. You know, yeah, we're the elders. <laughs> like, what? I'm like, a Slack channel for the community? I'm like, oh man, I don't like, I hate Slack. I know, we had to get rid of our Slack and move to Discord over the last yeah, year. Did you? Now. Yeah. Nobody wants Slack anymore. It's too old. Yeah, okay, good. You're like, okay. Maybe I missed that one. Yeah. Yeah. We... No, what I think I never realized that by trying to build a startup community that I was becoming an event organizer, right? Yeah. That, that caught me really by surprise. And then it was every time we found the event that was beautiful, magical, it worked perfectly. You know, after you do it six or eight times or a year yeah. or two, then nobody wants to show up anymore. And you have to just constantly rebrand, change the time, change it from coffee to beer, change it from beer to yep. whiskey, change it from whiskey back to coffee. And, yep. you know, I'm pretty sure in a few more years, we'll all be back to hackathons and maker fairs. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we've done all that. You're right. Because the, the hackathons kind of petered out, the maker fairs sort of petered out. I mean, we did try... I try and set aside a portion of my budget, you know, like 10, 15% of the budget. And I'm like, if you have an event, I'll sponsor it. Mm -hmm. So we really try and seed a lot of events. I think we, we can get a lot done with a little bit of money if you do it that way. Yeah. You know, if someone's like, hey, I want to pull together Women Who Code or, yeah. you know, Female Founder Fridays or whatever. I'm like, sure. Yeah. You know, and we'll run it for a little while, see if it works. If it's great, then we'll figure out a way to make it sustainable. If not, so I, I tend to plant a lot of seeds and see which ones flourish. What do you think about Reno? I thought Reno was great. I hadn't been in a long time. I was trying to, I felt like Doug had a really interesting handle on things. Um, I think his, his approach to, um, you know, really, really thinking about his role as a catalyst as opposed to the operator to me seemed like a, a really intelligent way to grow from, you know, operating an ecosystem from, you know, like, 12 years ago to today. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting to me is trying to observe how an ecosystem continues to evolve once somebody, you know, is sort of in place. Like, how do you continue to keep it fresh? Well, I mean, the fact that they talk about Tesla being there, you know, and all of the, the clean tech and the natural resources of Nevada, 
and the proximity in a healthy way to San Francisco, San Francisco and Silicon Valley, I think is where Reno sees itself in the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years. It's, it's honestly reinventing itself in a good way to attract and retain entrepreneurs, which is why I think it has such a good ecosystem right now. Yeah, I felt like it was a staggering amount of growth when he was saying when he first started that, um, you know, Doug said they had 20 million in venture capital investment. Mm -hmm. And then was it last year they had 1.2 billion. Right, right. And I, I keep thinking, I've been to so many communities where if you could get to 20 million, that would just be a game changer. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the whole point. That's what's, so, that's what's so great about, you know, our country is that we have lots of different cities at lots of different stages. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing that was um, was the pleasant surprises. I think a lot of times people think about um, how you know, traditional economic development focuses so much on bringing in these new businesses versus focusing on the startups. But like you were saying, you know, the Tesla seems to have made a really big impact in their community, not just in creating jobs around the, the Tesla factory, but then creating a startup community centered around I guess really the supply chain for Tesla. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, when you think about again, sort of the, you know, what is an entrepreneur? What does it take to have an entrepreneurship community? So part of it is standard of living, you know, the affordability of housing, of um, other services. Um, how how easy is it to start a business? I think Reno has the, that kind of recipe. I think that um, they talked about talent you know, getting talent either coming back again from California or retaining their own talent or growing their own talent. So I think educationally, like you have all of these things to create that ecosystem. And, and you know, they're, they're on this journey. They're, they're, they're on the journey right now of moving Reno into one of those kinds of cities um, to represent not only Nevada, but the rest of the country. Yeah, so what do you think is the most valuable thing you learned in Reno? The most valuable thing that I learned? I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that Doug and, and his team talked about was, was the culture, you know, the mindset of, um, he used the, the analogy of like a barn raising community. And so when people come and they say, I want to do this thing, they're like, great, how can we help? And so that's, that's an attitude that's pervasive in, in their entrepreneurial ecosystem, which I think is really healthy because if communities are like, you know, well, good luck with that, or you're my competition, then you're not going to be able to kind of have a rising tide, um, experience. So what was my take on Reno? I think the two things. One was, um, you know, I really appreciated Doug's uh, focus on aligning values first. Okay. Um, I think what I've seen is a lot of communities and a lot of organizations get caught up in the competition of trying to stay alive to sustain their organizations. And in some ways, I do think that so many times in ecosystem building that people are fighting for the basic resources to make it happen, that sometimes they lose sight of, you know, why they're doing it underneath. And I think that the ability to always go back to some core values about what's important for your community is the thing that will really help every mm -hmm. um, entrepreneur support organization, you know, continue to to grow the resources that they have and to succeed in their mission and to align partners into that work. So I think that part was really great. And the other part that I was really impressed with is just learning about how much the state of Nevada as a whole is beginning to look at ways to standardize data collection around entrepreneurship so that they can better document those impacts. So what's next after, uh, after Reno? So we're going to head back over the over the Sierras to Sacramento and then on to Oakland. So stay tuned. All right. Well, I guess we will see everybody from Sacramento. Bye-bye.